Welcome to Prehab Shadowing. We're an international student-led, woman-led, minority-led nonprofit for medical advancement. We have closed captions to accommodate students of all abilities and needs. And if you have any ideas as to how we can be more accessible, you can go ahead and email us at prehealthshadowing.com. You could save us as a contact, keep us out of spam. And you could also join our email list so you don't have to miss any of, of our upcoming sessions. And if you would like to stay in the loop, you can go ahead and uh, follow our Instagram and our TikTok. It's both Prehealth Shadowing. And since we host from students all over the world, where are you calling from right now? I'm currently in California. You can go ahead and put that in the chat. I will be able to see that and it'll be so cool. Okay. And if you're interested in being part of Prehealth Shadowing, we are always ex accepting student volunteers as well as team members currently. Here are some of the available roles that we have in the IT department and so much more. And you can go ahead and go on our application. This is where you'll be able to find it. If you're a high schooler, you can also go ahead and join our HTP leadership. So this is an amazing part as well to join our team. And if you have anything that you would like to get published, such as an article, reflection, review, or success stories, you can go ahead and submit it to blog submissions on our website. Since we do heavily rely on our time of our amazing volunteers, as well as the donations we receive, we would highly appreciate any donations that are made during this session. So make sure to type your questions in the chat. We'll be going over them toward the end, as well as sometime throughout. Um, there will most likely be possibly some interactive uh, activities during this session, so you can go ahead and put that in the chat and I will be able to read them out loud. And make sure to take good notes since there is a post shadowing assessment that you can take in order to earn her certificate. But yeah, and I do ask that you guys have your cameras on since it will create a true shadowing experience. And now I will be going ahead and passing it off to Dr. Matika. Yeah, I'll just, do you want me to share my screen again? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, let me just get this presentation up and started. You, do I play full screen? Nope. This is embarrassing already. I swear I've done a presentation before. If you click on the X and then just present, should be able to find it. Hmm. Let me just get it up and then I'll. Two seconds. Um, anyways, I'm Dr. Carling Matika. Um, I usually go by Dr. Carling or just Carling. Uh, I am a veterinarian located in Alberta, Canada. Um, and I'm going to attempt to still try to make this bigger. Let's see. In the meantime, I will be going ahead and having a polling quiz that you guys could go ahead and answer. So yeah. Um, I got it figured out now, so you just tell me when you're ready. Awesome. You could go ahead and like put it up right now. That'll be okay. great. Great. Um, so like I said, I'm a doctor of veterinary medicine. So I graduated just over four years ago now. Um, and I'm just gonna share a little bit about the world of veterinary medicine and a bit about my story and some cases with, with you today. So the plan is to go over a little bit about me. So I wanna gain some authenticity for you so that you'll actually believe my presentation. Um, I want to explain a little bit on how to get into veterinary medicine why I decided to go into veterinary medicine, my journey um, to a doctor of veterinary medicine or a DVM, we'll go through a couple cases and then we'll have a question section at the end. So like I was saying, I grew up in Alberta, Canada, um, in a small town called Pinoca, which is a town of about 7,000 people. So it's not very big. 
uh, to, to give a little bit of perspective since a lot of people don't know exactly where uh, everything in Canada is. It's about an eight hour drive from Montana. So we're just located just, just uh, north of you guys, um, if anyone is from Montana there. We're known for a few different things in Pinoca. So our claim to fame is we have the largest seven day rodeo in North America. Um, our town does go from 7,000 to about 50,000 people. So it is uh, quite, quite, um, quite a festival and it is actually next week. So we're looking forward to that. Um, our other claim to fame is we have the largest bronze bronc riding statue in the world. So uh, if you're ever driving through, be sure to look for that. I grew up on a farm just outside of Pinoca. So I'm a fourth generation farmer. Um, my parents and my grandparents and my great grandparents, or I guess my great grandparents settled there in 1919. So about 102 years ago now. Um, we are currently a primarily purebred bread and black Angus seed stock operation. So if you don't know a lot about the background of farming, um, a, a seed stock operation is a farm in which we raise breeding stock to sell to other farms so that they can improve their genetics. So we do a lot of embryo transplants, a lot of artificial insemination, and a lot of genetic testing so that we can continue to always improve the herd and our genetics. Um, Growing up on the farm, we also did have purebred sheep, um, specifically Suffolk sheep. You can see I spent some time showing sheep as a child. Um, and then we did have chickens and horses as well. Uh, it's, it's pretty interesting. One of the largest highways that goes through Alberta actually splits our farm in half. So there is an overpass between two the two major cities in Alberta that is called Matika Road and that is where our farm is located. Outside of veterinary medicine, I do surprisingly have a life. Um, sometimes it can be hard to believe that you can actually have a life outside of your job, but it is really important to try to maintain that work-life balance um, and, and try to keep some hobbies. So I'm quite interested in CrossFit, uh, powerlifting, skiing, skating, golfing, hiking. Um, being where we're at located in Alberta, I'm about an hour and a half away from the, map, the, the Rocky Mountains. So we do set, spend a significant amount of time in the mountains doing activities. Uh, I'm pretty obsessed with my little rescue dog, Maisie. Um, she comes pretty much everywhere with me and surprisingly doesn't have separation anxiety, but I'm very lucky that she can come to work with me. She comes to the gyms that I go to, um, and sh she's probably about 10 kg or 20, like 22 pounds. And she loves to chase the cows on the farm. So she spends quite a bit of time there also. Um, I'm pretty passionate about agriculture, which is probably not surprising based on my background. And I am part of a Canadian Agriculture Youth Council. Um, this, this is a council of 25 delegates from across Canada that were selected by our Ag Minister to represent and try to um, shape and change the industry for the upcoming youth. Um, so that's very exciting. Uh, I also quite enjoy socializing and then I am a bit of a painter too. I do quite enjoy traveling and I'm happy that COVID is a little bit less rampant now so that I can get back to it. Um, through my studies, I, I was able to get some, I guess, some opportunities to travel with the school. Uh, I did a spay and neuter dog um, rescue program in India. So I spent three weeks in India being able to travel. I spent some time in Thailand, um, Amsterdam. I just recently came back from Mexico and I've traveled most of the United States and Canada. So I've been very fortunate to be able to experience some very different cultures um, in, in my last 28 years. So how to get into vet school? Um, it really depends quite a bit on the school that you decide to go to. Uh, I'm gonna focus mostly on the schools in North America just because that's what I'm most familiar with. Uh, in the United States, there's a lot of different opportunities in 
most states have at least one vet school. Um, so that is excellent in comparison to Canada where we definitely don't have as many opportunities. Uh, so each, each school will have pretty similar requirements, but a little bit, a few differences. Um, I know that talking to graduates from the United States, it is definitely an advantage to go in state to go to school because there's, um, your tuition is significantly less than what you, than what it costs to go out of state. I know to go out of state, most students pay about 40 to $50,000 a year. So it does get quite costly. Um, in, in that aspect. So definitely quite a few different schools in the States to go to. In Canada, we only have five um, and there's quite a few different, there's more than five provinces in, um, or we, our, our states are called provinces in Canada. So our, um, there's quite a few different provinces in Canada, more, more than just five. So some of these uh, schools share which provinces they, allow into them. Um, the school that I went to was the University of Calgary. It is in Alberta. So I didn't have to travel too far from home to, to be able to go. However, they only accepted 30 students when I was going. So it was a pretty tight application process. Um, and I think in all of Canada, there's probably about just under 500 students that are accepted into vet school every year. Outside of Canada and the US, there are some different universities. Uh, I don't know as much about these universities, but those are some other options if you have a difficult time getting in, um, in your state or in your country. The prerequisite classes are actually fairly similar to going to medical school. So if you have any knowledge of that, um, you have to go and start a Bachelor of Science first. So most of the, the credits that you need to have are your sciences, your maths, um, your biologies, chemistries, those sorts of things. And then so many elective courses as well. The biggest thing is you have to maintain a very certain GPA to be competitive to get into the program. Um, so these are quite important classes to definitely pay a lot of attention in. One uh, big thing is that you have to have more than four classes in each term and your term is only considered your fall and your um, winter term so you can't take any spring or summer terms to get those classes so you have to have a true full course load of classes to be able to them for them to actually consider the classes that you've taken. The one of the newer things and I'm not sure. 100% in the states, I think there are some schools that require the MCAT as well, but the University of Calgary where I went to just started requiring the MCAT um, as part of their application process, which is great, but also I think can be a bit of a downfall. Um, I think now that people have to take the MCAT, it puts a lot more competition in both the medical program um, as well as the veterinary program because uh, most students will now apply for both. Another thing other than grades that you need to consider is your um, extracurricular activities. So you, you want to be more than just a smart student. Grades are definitely what's going to help you get into the program, but having a personality and being able to display that you were able to do, have a balance of you know, doing things plus maintaining your grades is super important. Um, I don't think that this differs from med school at all. Definitely be a part of different research programs, be a part of different clubs throughout the university, um, join sports teams, be involved in programs that are really going to um, help improve society, volunteer. I know that I did quite a few uh, different things. I was heavily involved in showing cattle, I continued to figure skate while I was doing my undergrad. Um, during the summer in my undergrad, I worked at a research facility. So I did, um, despite this being a pig here, I did beef and forage research. So I did research in feed that we feed um, cattle and just about the digestion related to that. Um, I also did some other crop researches related to agriculture. 
Uh, I was a part of the poultry club. So it was like a chicken related club through the university and the agriculture club. So just different ways to network. Um, often a lot of applications for some of these fairly academic programs require a profession, uh, professor reference. So one thing that I did find what, that helped me get these references um, that were a little bit more than just me being a number in the class was being a part of clubs like the poultry club um, or the ag club that was led by a particular professor that taught one of my classes as well. It just gave me another level of interaction with them to show that I actually have a personality outside of just being a student in their class. So if I can give any type of advice, if this is something that your school requires, definitely think it out at the beginning of your semester. If you have a particular class that you excel in, pick that class, find out what professor, maybe that professor's a part of a, a club, join that club and then spend some extra time asking questions, going in and asking for extra help, um, really building a rapport with that professor so that they actually know who you are when they go to write a reference. Um, if you are lucky enough to get an interview, there's two different types of interviews that they do in vet school. So there's MMIs, which are the multi mini interviews, and then there's a regular panel interview. So the multiple mini interviews are different in that you're given a scenario, given a few minutes to think about that scenario, and then presented in front of two individuals to discuss that scenario for about eight minutes. So in these types of situations, you really have to consider all the stakeholders um, or the people involved in every situation and all the different perspective and potential outcomes. But what it comes down to is you really need to make the conclusion on what the best outcome would be in that situation. Um, I've done the multi, I've been on both sides of the interview. So obviously sat in the hot seat and then I've been an interviewer as well. And the big thing that we're looking out for is just considering all the different perspectives, being empathetic to the different situations, and then just watching for red flags that could potentially be problems um, that could create problems if you were a professional in that situation. Panel interviews are more like your typical job interview. Um, I did have an interview like this as well when I went to um, interview for one of the other schools in Canada. And what I felt like is they were, they were really trying to kind of catch you in a lie. So be very honest and upfront about your um, experience. So don't lie about things, don't make things up. They're for sure gonna catch you. Also, they really just want to see that you're a well-rounded person. Um, some of the big things that I remember from the interview is they wanted to like, they asked me certain current events that were going on in the world. So they wanted to see that I actually do other things other than just focus on my studies. Uh, so the uh, Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program in general, it is a four-year program. Um, the first three years are mostly classroom based and then the last year is a full year of hands on practical experience. You learn everything so you don't focus on one particular area of uh, emphasis so if you want to be a small animal veterinarian you still have to learn some things about cows, but you can pick electives that are more focused on um, that small animal medicine. Uh, it is a very heavy course load. So you do go to school Monday to Friday, eight to 5 p.m. every day. Um, I think that most of the time we had anywhere from eight to 14 classes at a time. Uh, so there's not a lot of time to mess around outside of that school. It definitely is something that you have to commit to. Uh, outside, like once you graduate from the Doctor of Veterinary Medicine program, you can actually go and specialize. And this is something that I think really surprises people is that inside of veterinary medicine, we don't come out and then just become a general, well, we do come out and become a general practitioner, but you can actually go and do an internship and then a residency um, to specialize further. So there are quite a different um, variety of things that you can specialize in. Um, obviously, like certain different species, like a poultry veterinarian, 
Um, you can go and do a residency in an internship in, internship in anesthesiology, um, behavior, pharmacology, dermatology. Inside of internal medicine, we do have departments of cardiology, small animal internal medicine, large animal internal medicine, neurology, oncology, nutrition, um, diagnostic imaging, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, typically, if you want to be a surgeon, to, or not typically, but like if you want to be a board certified surgeon, you do go and do further um, a residency and an in, or an internship in a residency as well. So this is an additional five years of schooling on top of your four years of your uh, DVM program as well as your undergrad. So once these specialists come out, they're very knowledgeable uh, and it's, it's pretty amazing the amount of time that they put into their schooling. So to, that was a, a bit of an overview on the program. Um, I guess a little bit about why I wanted to pursue veterinary medicine. Uh, it's always, always been my dream to be a veterinarian for as long as I can remember. Um, I grew up on a farm and I just always wanted to be able to have a voice for the voiceless. So I've always loved, I loved all our barn cats. I loved all our farm dogs. Um, but what I really loved was the cattle um, and being able to really have an impact on improving welfare for those animals, as well as ensuring that we have safe food to feed our world. Um, was a really huge impact of why I wanted to become a veterinarian. So my specific journey to becoming a vet as I graduated high school, this is little me back when side bangs and side parts were cool. Um, I went off to Grant McEwen University, which was a smaller university in Edmonton, um, Alberta, which is our capital city. Um, it's about an hour away from my small town. Uh, and this university was a really good stepping stone for me. The class sizes weren't much bigger than 100 people, which was spectacular because I was going from a graduating class of 100 people in general. So going into big auditoriums was just a little bit of a, a shell shock for a small town kid like me. Uh, I started doing my Bachelor of Science and I did my prerequisite programs. And I did apply for the veterinary medicine program after, after two years and I was rejected. Um, it did definitely suck, but I was, I did have those expectations that, you know, two years, I wasn't necessarily mature enough or ready to go off into a, a specialty program at that point. Um, then I transferred over to the University of Alberta, which is our, the bigger university in Edmonton. And I was able to specialize my Bachelor of Science a little bit more focused on agriculture, specifically in food animal research. Uh, so in that aspect, I did learn a lot more about the agriculture industry. I was able to develop a lot more knowledge about veterinary medicine, um, which really did help me excel in my interviews. So after my third year um, of my Bachelor of Science, I was accepted into the University of Calgary uh, faculty of veterinary medicine, which is about three hours south of Edmonton. So I didn't have to go too, too, too much further away. Um, my vet school experience was, I would, I don't even know what to compare it to. It was like had its highs and had its lows. Um, we only had a class that graduated of 27 students. So we were a fairly small class. Um, and I had some pretty amazing opportunities to to do some pretty great things and have some pretty cool experiences. Um, we did quite a bit of different research on like wild caribou. Um, we had a teaching herd at the hospital as well. Um, I spent some time at a specialty dairy hospital. I spent some time in California with dairy cattle. Uh, I went to some different conferences down in the States. Uh, overall, I definitely don't regret going to vet school which is good because now I'm a veterinarian so I don't really have much of a choice uh the what's interesting about the program is they shape it so it's it's fairly um it builds upon itself um the first year we really learned about everything that was normal uh so you learn about your anatomies your physiologies your behavior um your different uh types of like different specialties you can go into it was so long ago, I don't even remember what else I learned. Um, the second year you learn about what's abnormal. So all of your like 
microbiology, virology, immunology, pathologies, clin pathologies. So you learn about everything that can go wrong. And then in third year, you learn how to fix it. So then you actually start to learn about how everything comes together and we actually get to be a real doctor and fix things and not everything dies. So that was, that was cool. And then fourth year, we actually don't have a teaching hospital. So we travel around Alberta, Canada, North America, and the world and go into different real world situations where we're able to get hands-on experience um, in different fields that we're particularly interested in. So finally, in 2018, I graduated. Um, and at that point, I moved back to my hometown in Pinoca, which I said I would never move back to, but I did. Um, the grass is always greener on the other side, and sometimes the right opportunity presents, and it just made sense. So I started working at a mixed animal practice there, where there was 10 other veterinarians to work together with to um, work on all different types of species. So, so hopefully you're not a squeamish, but if you are, sorry, um, we deal with a lot of blood. Uh, so this is the picture on the left-hand side is me doing a, a C-section on a cow. Um, what surprises most people is that cows actually stay standing for their C-sections. So we do fully block them. They get like a full epidural that freezes their whole left-hand side of their body. Um, and then you cut through their skin and then their three layers of muscle through their peritoneum and into their abdomen. Um, and you shift the uterus up and you make a slice through it and you pull the calf out. Usually at that point, because I'm not a very, very big person, I need a little bit of extra help from the farmer, but we get that calf out and then stitch everything up. Um, the image on the right hand side is not the calf that came out of that cow, but that is a, a macerated fetus uh, that actually died inside the cow and then started to rot. So we would call this an emphysetomous fetus. Uh, she was sometimes when they die, the body doesn't tell them that they're supposed to um, like abort the fetus or miscarry it right away. So we noticed that she was showing signs of some vaginal discharge, she was starting to smell, she was going off feed. Um, so when I went in to check to see if the calf was still viable, the fluid around it, we use an ultrasound rectally, and the fluid around it was, was quite nasty, didn't look healthy, there was no heartbeat anymore. So we did give her some medication to help dilate the cervix. And then in two days, the cervix was dilated, and I was able to actually pull this nasty thing out. Um, but we did save the cow, so worth it. Uh, then we do, we do get to see some puppies and kitties as well. So um, obviously the picture on the left is not a puppy. This is a, this is a uterus and a dog. So this uterus uh, had a, what we would call a pyometra. So it's a uterine infection. We can see this commonly in older dogs that are not spayed. So this is an emergency surgery because that uterus is filled full of infection that can end up spreading throughout the body and killing the animal. So that was me removing the uterus and removing the infection. And then on the right hand side, that's just me with this really cute puppy I was doing vaccines on. Um, some other large animal things that we do. So this this cow had a foot rot, um, which is a, a bacterial infection in the foot that's caused by a bacteria called uh, Fusobacterium necroforum. Um, and it's actually a bacteria that's present in the soil, but sometimes if they get a cut on their foot and this bacteria is able to get inside and proliferate, then it can cause infection and an abscess. Uh, so this one obviously looks pretty nasty. We did take an x-ray of it. Um, this toe is nice and healthy. This toe is not nice and healthy. And the reason I say that is because it right here, we've lost the integrity of the joint space and it kind of has like a moth eaten appearance. And we call that an osteomyelitis. So the infection has actually invaded into the bone. Uh, which at that point, being able to get an infection out of the bone is relatively serious um, and takes some pretty intensive care. So a lot of the time in our food animal world, so in cows, we always have to consider and balance the economics of the situations, 
plus the food safety, um, plus the realism of whatever we're planning on doing. So actually what a really common procedure to deal with an osteomyelitis in a digit on a cow or this toe is we actually amputate the toe um, and just completely remove the infection. So this cow, she will, she would have been put on antibiotics um, to ensure that the infection doesn't spread anywhere else. But this little piece of toe that was amputated off was quite infected and nasty. Um, and quite a bit of the tissue was dead. So there was no coming back from that. Um, one thing to point out is that with any food animal that is given antibiotics, there is a withdrawal time before that animal can go to slaughter. So that means that there will be no detectable residue of those antibiotics in any meat that you're consuming ever. Um, back to dogs and cat world, enough about the cows. So this is a pug that had a perforated corneal ulcer. Um, so this is the conjunctiva of the eye. You can see there's quite a bit of conjunctivitis, conjunctivitis quite a bit of redness. Um, this is the, um, the iris of the eye right here coming into it. And then this white piece here, that's the perforated corneal ulcer. So this was a non-healing ulcer, um, which ideally there's some procedures that we can do that are like a mix of surgical plus intensive care. This owner was cost concerned. So there, and they weren't willing to do intensive drops, intensive procedures. So instead we enucleated the eye, which means removing the eye. Um, and the little pug did really, really well. Um, honestly, dogs do not care if they have one eye on it and, and they don't really care if they, if they lose two eyes. So this dog is a weird case of a rescue dog that was rescued from Northern Canada. Um, and it was, it has a congenital glaucoma. So it isn't a photoshopped image. It actually, its eyes are this big uh, because it was born with such high pressures in its eyes that they continued to bulge as the dog grew. The dog's completely blind in both eyes. Um, and it also had a anterior luxated lens. So the lens should be held in a nice position so that we can see it or so that you can see through the eye, but because the globe of the eye had gotten so big, the lens had actually um, luxated and the optic nerve was no longer attached in the right position. So this dog did get a, a bilateral enucleation uh, on, on its both of its eyes too. Um, so after, I spent three years in Pinoca. I moved back to Calgary, which is a quite a bigger city in comparison to Pinoca. I work at FenBet, um, which is a little bit more of a, or is quite a progressive practice. Uh, we do mostly small animal now, which is unfortunate because I love cows, but we're trying to open a large animal department. So hopefully we will eventually get to that point. I also am an emergency veterinarian locum. So I go to emergency vet hospitals and I'll pick up shifts to do emergency work on weekends. Uh, and then I also am fairly into sharing stuff on Instagram. So I do have a, a few Instagram partnerships that I work with as well. Um, so now I do quite a lot of small animals, even ferrets, um, which ferrets are interesting because they have quite the stench to them. They have a weird scent gland that just makes them smell very different than any other species. I do a lot of mentorship now. So it, it's interesting moving from a practice where I was one of the youngest veterinarians into moving to a practice where I was one of the most experienced veterinarians. And now every day I teach people new things, which is bizarre because I'm like, I still feel like I don't know anything, but I do know a lot and it's nice to be able to mentorship them. Um, I love surgery. So this is the before and after of a lump removal. This lump was just a big lipoma, which is a fatty mass. Um, no concern of it metastasizing other places. The biggest concern with this lump was just that because of the area it was in, if it continued to grow larger, it could have caused issues with the dog walking. And as a mass grows larger, we get concerned about having 
having the same ability to remove it. So we did remove it at still a fairly large size, but um, at least it was not as bad to remove. Um, again, more surgery things. So the one thing about our patients is unlike humans, they can't tell us what they do. So we do rely a lot on our history and our diagnostics to try to get down to the bottom of what's going on. So this dog had an intestinal obstruction um, and had ate something that caused it to block its intestines. So it presented for vomiting. Um, uh, we took some x-rays, we did an ultrasound, we suspected that there was most likely a jejunal foreign body. So the intestines, you can see this is a nice healthy piece of intestine, and this is a big angry piece of intestine. So I'd made um, an enterotomy site just kind of further away from the foreign body, and I milked it in and removed it from that site. Um, so I was lucky enough in this situation that the intestine was healthy to healthy enough to leave it. But in some cases, the foreign body will obstruct blood flow and actually kill the intestine. And we will have to do resections of the intestines um, where essentially you'll cut off the unhealthy piece and glue back to, or not glue back, stitch back together the healthy pieces. Uh, and they do do very, very well. Um, there was, I did have this very cool experience of being in a storybook. So I'm, um, uh, one of my clients wrote me into a storybook, uh, about coping with euthanasia and helping children cope with, um, when their pets are put down. So that was very cool. Uh, I know that I had just talked about some cases, but I'm going to just go through a few other um, cases a little bit more in depth to see just a bit more about the world of veterinary medicine. So this one's called the regurgitating Great Dane, or I guess the gagging Great Dane. Uh, so this uh, Great Dane presented, his presentation was a male neutered six-year-old Great Dane that was gagging up white foam for the last hour. Um, I, if you want, should, should we be interactive? Should we not be interactive? How much time do we have? We have a lot of time. We can be interactive. Okay. So what are some questions that you might want to ask the owner? You guys can go ahead and put that in the chat and I will read them out loud. What's the dog's diet? What's the dog's diet? The dog eats um just a, a regular kibble from the vet clinic how old is the dog the dog's six years old did he drink anything other than water he has not drank anything other than water no are there any weird substances that the dog could have ate um, the owner said that they did leave the garbage out, but they don't think that he got into it. Okay. Okay. Is any more? Nope. That seems like all. Oh, another one. Any diet changes or excessive exercise? I'm not sure what the last one is. Oh, exercise. So great, great question. That is a big thing that I always ask too, is have there been any diet changes? Cause that can definitely be a reason for like vomiting. Um, no diet changes, but they did let the dog run right after eating. Okay. Any so, exposure to wild animals? No exposure to wild animals. Good question though. Um, so the history that I had kind of got that nothing like this has ever ha happened before. He ate dinner about one hour ago. There was no chance that he got into any toxins, chemicals, or drugs. There was no food changes. He has no other medical problems. He's on no medication and they have no missing toys in the house. So I started with my physical exam. We did, I did a heart rate, which was around 200 beats per minute. Um, now for a Great Dane, Great Danes are typically quite large dogs. The average heart rate of a dog is typically between 80 to 120 beats per minute. 
And I wouldn't expect a dog like a Great Dane to be sitting around 80 to 90 during my exam. So 200 beats per minute is pretty significant. Um, in medical terms, we consider this being tachycardic. His temperature was 39.8 degrees Celsius. I'm sorry, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit. Probably over 104 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, so it was high. Typically dogs, I like to be somewhere between like 99.5 Fahrenheit to like 103 Fahrenheit and in Celsius, 37.5 to 39.5. So this was high. His respiratory rate, he was panting. On the oral exam, he was hypersalivation, so excessive salivation. His mucous membranes were pale, so he had pale gums, and his capillary refill fill time, so when I push on his gums and release, how fast it turns pink again took about three seconds, so this was prolonged. He had a cardiac arrhythmia and a very bloated abdomen. So all together, this was all of the information that we had. What are some diagnostics that you think would be a good idea to run? or some tests. You guys can also go ahead and put that in the chat. Talk screen, dehydration or exhaustion, blood test. Fecal. Good, good. Good, I think those are all really good ones. So. We definitely worry about, yeah, toxin, different toxins that they'd get into. We worry about what the blood work is doing. Um, a big one that with a case like this is I want to take, actually take x-rays. So with Great Danes, they're, they have a really big, deep chest um, and they are predisposed to getting like a bloat or their stomach twists. So this is an x-ray of the abdomen of a Great Dane. Um, and to orient yourself a little bit, can you see my mouse? Okay, good. So this right here, this is the heart. This is the spine. This is the diaphragm. These are his lungs here. And this big object is his stomach. Um, so on x-rays, Tissues and bone show up, or bone shows up really white. Mineral will show up really white. Tissues usually show up shades of gray and air and gas show up black. So his stomach is quite, quite filled with air. All of these little loops are all loops of bowel. Um, and the big thing that we look for in, in these types of cases is like, we call it a Popeye's arm. Um, and that's um, very indicative to us that he has a gastric dilation volvulus or a twisted stomach. So to explain a little bit more gastric dilation volvulus, we also abbreviate it as a GDV. So what happens is, is this is the stomach sitting in its normal position. The esophagus begins to twist um, and the uh, bottom portion or the top portion of the stomach starts to point upwards. Then the stomach twists around and moves to the opposite side and air starts to trap in it and the stomach starts to distend. So you can see it's all wrapped around and it's the backwards way that it's supposed to be. So this will start to prevent any outflow. Um, so that's why he's, he's trying to gag, but all he's able to gag up is saliva um, and not actually any real fluid. He's just gagging up white foam. The biggest risk to this is if it continues to fill with air, um, this, it can cause pressure on the vessels that are bringing blood to the stomach and the outflow of the vessels away from the stomach, and it actually can kill that tissue. So we also did run um, some blood work too. So he did have a decreased blood pressure or a hypovolemia. So this would be part of the reason why we're starting to see some really pale mucous membranes and a decreased capillary refill time. Um, we did run a PCV total solids, which looks at his red blood cell concentration. 
Um, and it was quite increased, which is suggested of dehydration. He had an increased lactate, which lactic acid will build up with trauma in certain tissues. So we knew that there was some tissue damage happening to that stomach. Um, and then he had a moderate hypokalemia, which means he has decreased potassium, uh, which can be an electrolyte abnormality when we're starting to see um, kind of shifts in toxins and stuff in the body, especially when we're not able to perfuse tissues the right way, and a mild hypoglycemia. So he had a low blood sugar as well. So initially, we wanted to do some pretty intense acute stabilization. So he got an IV fluid bolus um, at 60 mils per kg per hour over 15 minutes to try to help because he had such low blood pressure. We gave him some pain medication, which was we, we gave in this case methadone, um, which is an opioid and obviously fentanyl is another choice. Uh, I had a question here for vet students on why we wouldn't use turbogesic. Turbogesic um, is a... Um, type of opioid, but it doesn't help with pain. So it just is more of a sedative. Uh, the next thing that we wanted to do is we wanted to relieve some of that pressure from the stomach. So we were doing an orogastric intubation first. So we placed a tube down the dog's stomach or down the dog's throat and into the stomach to try to relieve that gas. However, because of the twist on the esophagus, I wasn't able to get in. So that's when we did a trocarization. And that's when we actually stabbed the stomach with a catheter to try to release some air so that we don't continue to do damage to that tissue. So then we rechecked his TPR, which is temperature, pulse, um, respirate. Uh, at that point, the arrhythmia was gone because we didn't have the same degree of pain from having that pressure on the stomach. His mucous membranes were quite pink and his CRT had returned to two seconds. We had no more gagging and retching and he had normalized his blood pressure. So at this point, we still have to go to surgery. So that stomach is still twisted. It hasn't untwisted. We just released the pressure that was causing so much pain for the Great Dane. Um, prior to surgery, especially because we're worried about um, tissue dying and infection, we do give a bolus of antibiotics. So an injectable antibiotic called cefazolin is given while they're prepping for, sur for surgery. In the surgery, we make a very large abdominal incision and we always have to evaluate the stomach as well as the spleen for vascular compromise or dead tissue. So dead tissue, we also refer to as necrosis. So the spleen is kind of connected in the tissue that attaches to the stomach. So if the stomach twists, sometimes it can also cause um, a block of those those vessels that go to the spleen too. So if we start to notice that our spleen has changes in color, it shows that it's dead and we also have to take the spleen out. If we're starting to see blackened sections of the stomach, that means that we also have to remove, remove a portion of the stomach too. Because even though we fix the twist, it still can end up causing that, that tissue will die and then cause infection. Um, so we do, rotate the stomach back into the correct position. Um, sometimes you pa I pass the stomach tube down just to get rid of any of that nasty fluid that's still in the stomach. And then we do something that's called a gastropexy. So this is actually where we take the stomach and we tack it to the body wall. So you can see in this image here, this is the stomach and then the body wall is right beside it. So we, we don't make a full thickness incision through both structures, but we make um, the stomach is made of multiple layers, so we make a slight incision through the mucosa of the, or the serosa of the stomach, and then we make a slight incision through the body wall muscle, and we actually stitch them together, so in the future, this prevents this from happening. So post-op, there's quite a few things that we want to monitor for. Um, we want to monitor for continued arrhythmias because once we get the stomach untwisted, it allows all of that blood that was stuck in the stomach 
um, or like in the surrounding vessels around the stomach that we're holding toxins to just reperfuse the whole body. So sometimes what we can see is reperfusion injury. So this, all those toxins go other places and that can cause some pretty, some pretty bad things like changes in electrolytes, um, the start of uh, cardiac arrhythmias, changes in blood pressure and shock. So we do want to be really, really, um, we really want to monitor them for the next 24 to 48 hours to make sure that they're they're stable. Um, I typically do no food here. I said 24 to 48 hours, but I'm a softie and typically do give, start to give them food in 12 hours. Um, just small little meatballs to see if they'll, or like small little balls of food to see if they'll have their stomach can handle it. Um, and then we have quite the list of medication that we want them on to make sure that they heal appropriately. So continued IV fluids, um, continued pain control, continued antibiotics, um, we're going to use something called a prokinetic, which is an intestinal mobility agent to make sure that their guts get moving again. Um, often with intestinal surgeries, because the gut is painful, it doesn't want to move. So we want to give it some medication to make sure that it's moving. Acid blockers for the stomach to help to make sure that we don't create any stomach ulcerations. And then an antiemetic, which is an anti-nausea medication so that um, we, we don't the dog doesn't keep trying to vomit with, with everything that has gone on. Uh, so with uh, a case like this, there are things that we can do to prevent it. So we can do a gastropexy preemptively during their spay or neuter surgery um, because certain breeds are predisposed to it. Um, so this is something that I'll commonly do in routine surgeries. Uh, I'll maybe leave the questions till the end, just because I do have one more case. Um, this next case is called the puzzling pit bull. So I had this pit bull that got surrendered to the clinic. Um, someone had found it just circling in, in their backyard. Um, and it was a one-year-old intact male. Um, what do you want to know about the the dog what do you want to know about the history you guys can go ahead and put that in the chat is the dog microchipped no no microchip how much does the dog weigh the dog was probably 80 pounds. Was or, there any physical? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, sorry. I was going to do NKG too. 80 pounds or 37 kg. Was there any physical or emotional abuse? Uh, not that the rescue knows of. So the rescue obviously like brought the dog to us. Um, not that the rescue knows of. They couldn't see any obvious trauma to the dog, so they were unsure of whether or not it had any previous abuse. Is the dog fully vaccinated, i.e. to prevent intestinal worms and etc.? The dog was not fully vaccinated and had no dewormer history. Okay, those are all great questions. Um, so on, I did try to get a little bit more history and the hard part was, was that because they had just kind of, someone had just found the dog and then given it to the rescue and then it got surrendered to the clinic, we had relatively no history on it other than we knew that it wasn't microchipped. We knew that it wasn't vaccinated um, or dewormed because it had thrown up worms as well. Um, on our physical exam, the dog was doing quite a bit of head bobbing. And what was interesting is like dogs can walk in circles, but if dogs are walking in circles continuously, that's abnormal. Um, the dog had very dilated pupils, which we called mitriasis in medical terms, um, with normal PLRs, which is pupillary light reflex. So your eye, when it's exposed to light, your pupils constrict. When it's in the dark, your pupils get bigger. So those are a normal neurologic um, thing that should happen. However, uh, or this dog did have normal ones, just very dilated pupils. 
Uh, he had tachypnea, which is breathing really fast, and he was panting. His heart rate was 200 beats per minute, which we had discussed before that 80 to 120 is kind of the norm. If a dog is nervous in clinic, 140 to 150, I kind of am understanding about, but 200 in this type of dog is something to be worried about. His temperature was 40 degrees Celsius, which is probably about 104 degrees Fahrenheit. So he was significantly hyperthermic. Um, he was hypertensive, so he had quite high blood pressure. He had hyperesthesia, which means that when I would like clap, he was like overly sensitive to the stimuli. Or if like something happened, if you like, you kind of like went up, like, I don't know, psyched him out, he would like be overly dramatic to that response. Um, one other thing that we check when we're doing a neurologic exam is it's a proprioceptive test where we take the dog's knuckles and we put them over um, on the floor and they should put them back right away. And that's a way knowing that their brain is working properly to tell them that they should know where their limbs are supposed to be in space. That was normal. So there were a few confusing things about this dog was showing. And overall, I would say that this dog was not neurologically appropriate. So when I started thinking of differentials, because we want to consider all the different factors that could come into play to be causing him to show these signs, there's a few different things that I think of when I see a circling dog that's doing a bit of head bobbing, that's just not completely neurologically normal. So I think of otitis media or otitis interna. So this is a middle ear or an inner ear infection. Um, when the inner ear or the middle ear infection or what is infected, typically we'll see dogs have a head tilt and they'll actually circle towards the ear that is infected. Um, however, what was interesting about this dog is he was circling in both directions and despite the head bobbing, he had no distinct head tilt. So I was a little bit less concerned about this being a middle or an inner, inner ear infection. Now, not knowing his history, I was pretty concerned about toxins, chemicals, or drugs. Um, definitely could be any of those, especially with the very severely dilated pupils. I worry about a nutritional deficiency. Um, it's really important that dogs and puppies are on a complete and balanced diet. Dogs are not humans. They can't eat the same things that we eat to properly grow. So especially not knowing his history, we don't know if maybe there is some sort of brain dysfunction because he didn't have the proper balance of nutrients. Um, I worry about the organs in his body not being able to properly detoxify toxins. So if there is some sort of liver disease or renal or kidney disease, potentially could show some neurologic signs as well. We worry about congenital abnormalities. Um, being that he was only about around a year old, it is potential that maybe he's been suffering with signs like this his entire life. Finally, a little bit lower on the list, but we can't take it off the list. We always have to consider a brain tumor or neoplasia or um, cancer. So we start to do some diagnostics. Now, sometimes this video plays and sometimes it doesn't. So we'll see if it does, but this is kind of this, what he was doing. So you can tell that like, this is not a normal dog. He was very confused. Oh, and then another cute little dog. Um, so the first thing I wanted to run was a urine drug test and he did come positive. It did come back positive for methamphetamines and amphetamines. So he was quite high on meth. Um, and when actually we were able to get in contact with the people who did actually own the dog and ask about whether or not it was possible that their dog could have gotten into meth, they said that it was quite possible. So this dog was high on meth and this is what a meth dog looks like. Um, we ran a complete blood count, um, which is part of the blood work and it was within normal limits. And we ran a chemistry panel. So a chemistry panel will look at the renal values, the liver values, the electrolytes, pancreas, kind of just everything that's going on inside. And this dog had an azotemia. So he had increased creatinine, increased BUN. These are more um, 
kidney values that are elevated. So I did have a note. I did put a little why here. Um, I don't think that, I don't expect you to know this answer to why he had an azotemia. So the reason for it was actually because he was so twitchy and freaking out, his muscles were constantly twitching. So they were actually overproducing byproducts which was making it hard for the kidneys to filter. So we started to actually see of a buildup of toxins in the body. So it wasn't that he had an actual acute kidney injury. It was more just that because he was so twitchy, he created uh, rhabdomyolysis. So to treat a meth dog, we typically would do decontamination, which get them to throw up within the first two hours. However, because he was already showing clinical signs, we knew that that was completely pointless. We did administer charcoal um, orally. So we got him to eat some charcoal. Charcoal can help bind toxins out of the system. So the hope is, is that they're slowly metabolized so that we don't see as many side effects. We want to control the central nervous system stimulation. So because he's so twitchy and drugged out, we want to sedate him and decrease the stimuli that's creating him to, that's creating him to be hyperreactive so we can help prevent those acute kidney failure signs that we were seeing on blood work. Because he had a hyperthermia, we want to do some thermoregulation and cooling. For the muscle tremors, we're going to give him a muscle relaxant called methacarbamol. We're gonna keep them on IV fluids to help um, flush the system and get all the drugs out. Um, an intralipid infusion is a particular type of um, fat infusion that helps actually pull drugs out of the system. So we did give him that as well. And then anti-nausea medication. In this case, we didn't have to resort to anti-epileptics or anti-arrhythmics because we didn't see any or hear any arrhythmias and he didn't go into any seizure-like states. So with the, the increased azotemia or the increased kidney values, the biggest thing we were focused on was IV fluids, anti-nausea medication, and just rechecking that chemistry and urinalysis to make sure that things were returning to normal. So he had improved clinical signs in 24 hours. He had a significantly improved azotemia. So we knew that it was actually from muscle breakdown or increased muscle activity versus actual kidney damage. And then we plan to recheck his chemistry again in two weeks. That is it. That is all I had to talk about. So hopefully you gained something from the presentation. Um, I'm very passionate about veterinary medicine and the agriculture industry and what we're able to do to help our voiceless pets. Um, I hope that you feel a little bit more passionate about it too. Um, and I'm open to any questions you might have. Thank you so much. You guys can go ahead and put your questions in the chat and I will say them out loud. Okay, we already have some questions. Okay, so the first question we have is, is there anything you would have done differently if you could go back? Like go back in the cases, go back to vet school. Through becoming a vet. Um, that's a tough one. No, not necessarily. I'd say that it's, and I think everyone always says this, is just like not to take things so seriously. Um, obviously getting into vet school, you do need to take your grades and your, your school seriously, cause it's important to get in. But once you're in, um, you don't have to get A's all the time. Like it's just focus on being there and getting hands-on experience and appreciate the time that you get to spend with your friends and the mentors that you have. Um, I'd say that I wish that I've did a little bit more hands-on stuff and, and focused a little bit less on the books once I got into vet school. Another question we have is, do you work with any other medical professionals? Um, other than veterinarians, yeah, kind 
kind of because the, like in the, the medical world, we have this concept called One Health. So it is like humans, animals, and the ecosystem, we all interact together. So we have to have healthy animals to have healthy people, healthy people, healthy ecosystem, um, yada, yada, yada. So we do work with like epidemiologists, we do work with human physicians when it comes to certain diseases, because there are diseases that can be transmissible between humans and animals. Um, those particular diseases we call zoonotic diseases. Um, a case, for example, uh, in where we're at in Alberta, we don't really see a lot of leptospirosis. Um, but we did have a dairy farm that actually had lepto and the farmer was very, very sick also. And the only way that the doctors here or the human doctors figured out that he had lepto was because the veterinarians or us at the, the vet clinic had diagnosed his farm having lepto. So those just weren't tests that were necessarily on their radar. So we do work somewhat in combination with them, but not super, super close contact all the time. Another question we have is any mentors or people you looked up to that helped through the journey or becoming a vet and starting to gain experience? Yeah, definitely. So um, being growing up on a farm, we worked pretty closely with our vet clinic in town. So those were definitely some pretty big mentors to me um, that made a big impact on my life. Moving into vet school, a lot of my professors had a quite a large impact, especially the ones that took a keen interest in um, my love for cattle. Um, they definitely tried to go above and beyond to make sure that I had the experience and the opportunities that I needed to, to pursue um, a career in bovine medicine. Um, and then just starting out in practice, I had an amazing associate mentors that I, I can't imagine being where I am without them. They just, you know, when you come out of any program, whether it's med school, pharmacology, vet school, anything, like I'm, I'm friends with lots of different professionals and industries, you really don't know a whole lot. Like, you know, a lot of information, but you just don't know how to apply it. So having those mentors to be there for you to just like, encourage you and point you in the right direction and double check your work. Um, they just give you so much confidence. And yeah, without them, I definitely wouldn't be who I am. Another question we have is how has your lifestyle changed since you've become a vet? So being, my life has definitely changed since being a vet student. I have much more of a work-life balance now that I'm no longer a student. Um, going from like undergrad to vet school was a big jump because in undergrad, I had definitely more free time to spend time with my friends and my family and, and my extracurriculars. Excuse me, in vet school, there was definitely less time for that. Um, and I was super poor, so that also sucked. Now, being a veterinarian, it was, it's been an interesting change because you have this goal that you work on for so long. Um, like I worked towards to being a veterinarian forever and that's all that mattered. And then all of a sudden I was a veterinarian and now, then I was like, now what? I'm here, what do I do? So I really had to like remember how to have a work-life balance and teach myself to have it. It was really easy to just like fall into working all the time, but and able to like maintain your mental stability, you need to like find hobbies and try new things and remember what it's like to make new friends and spend time with people. And um, so it was definitely my life was a bit of an adjustment in my first year out, but I feel like it's getting easier each year as I'm able to find a better balance between hobbies and friends and work. Thank you so much. Another question we have is you mentioned becoming a vet partly to make sure the cattle you helped would provide safe foods that feed people of the world. What should one look for when trying to find healthy meat? I'm sorry if this question is offensive slash inappropriate. No, not at all. Um, definitely a good question. 
Uh, it's, it's a little bit harder for me to comment on if you're in the United States, just because I understand the Canadian food system a little bit better, but really like North America has quite high standards when it comes to food quality. We're very lucky here that we do have such high standards. Um, looking for things like, you know, you really pay for quality. So going to your local farmer's market um, and supporting the local farmers versus going to the big chain superstores um, that you're going to get a higher quality product that's probably treated better. Um, every, every product that's produced should have a level of standard that they should maintain. However, there's always bad apples in every bunch. So just try to learn as much as you can about where you're sourcing your meat from or the, the, um, the I guess the meat plant that it's coming from and just try to understand kind of what their ethics are and how they treat their people and where they source their meat. Um, just do your research, get it from reputable sources. Another question we have is, do you have any recommendations as to organizations or somewhat life hacks students should take when going into a route like yours? Sorry, I missed just the second half of that question. Uh, life hacks or tips for students who want to get into a field like yours? Yeah, um, I would say, depending on where you're at now, consider if you're interested in any point of agriculture, definitely going to a school that has an ag program. I feel like that was a big life hack on my part, just because I, even though I grew up on the farm, a lot of the things that we did, I didn't fully understand. So it did help going to an ag program, just understanding more about, um, I shouldn't say ag program, an animal science program. It helps me understand more about the agriculture industry, but I also was able to take like animal behavior classes, um, like even like small animal animal behavior um, and things like that as, as elective classes that just helped me understand a bit more about what I was getting myself into. Um, that I think was definitely beneficial. Um, being involved in if you're not a great like public speaker doing things like toastmasters um or different types of like impromptu speaking uh definitely helps with your interviews i did like growing up did quite a few i was in 4-h forever which is similar to ffa um so i grew up doing public speaking competitions which also led me into doing interview competitions. So any way that you can kind of get yourself involved and push yourself outside of your comfort zone to get better at speaking skills, um, hands-on experience and knowledge behind kind of the veterinary industry. Uh, I never really spent a lot of time volunteering in clinics, but that was because I felt like I had a lot of other attributes that kind of gave me that volunteer-esque experience in a clinic but that would also be a really good way to try to just gain a bit more background and understanding and give you kind of a leg up when it comes to applying. Another question we have is how much are you paid? Sorry if this is a strange question. No, it's a good question. And it's something that you should never be embarrassed to talk about. So uh, it really varies depending on what you're doing. Um, I network with quite a few different veterinarians in the United States as well. Um, so I'm gonna kind of base it off the US dollar. So starting wage um, for a new grad veterinarian, I think is between 90 to 100,000. Um, and then it kind of goes up with experience. So I'd say if you're always going to be an associate working some under someone, you can probably get your wage up to between 150 to 175,000. Obviously, if you open your own practice, then it can go further beyond that, just depending on how your practice prospers. Um, so it is a little bit variable, definitely not as good as some of the other um, medical industries or professional industries, but I don't think that there's many veterinarians that go in it for the money. Sorry. My
Another question is, do you have supply of blood and oxygen in your vet area for when you do surgeries on the animals? Yes, so we, yes, always oxygen. Um, so when we do surgeries, it's very similar to all human surgeries. Patients are given, I apologize, my dog is barking. She's very upset someone door. Um, when we do all our surgeries, they're, they're given pre-medication first and then are given an injectable induction agent, intubated, and then they're put on gas anesthesia and monitored the entire time um, throughout surgery. Uh, so always, yes, oxygen. Blood products, it depends on the practice. So when I'm at emergency practices, we always have blood products available in case we need to do a blood transfusion. Um, at my general practice that I work at 90% of the time, um, we don't do that type of surgery or those types of complex surgeries where I'm super concerned that things are going to bleed out. Uh, if I have a dog that comes in, that's a trauma, that's bleeding into its abdomen, I'm going to send them into the city uh, or like to the emergency hospital where they can get an adequate blood transfusion. Um, similar to like, you're not going to go to your GP human doctor for a blood transfusion. You're going to go to a, an emergency hospital for that. Um, the interesting thing in dogs is actually that there's only two blood types. So, and your first time you give a transfusion is kind of like, it doesn't matter what blood type you have, it's safe to give. So if we have to give a blood type or sorry, if we have to give a blood transfusion, we can actually pull blood from one of our veterinarians dogs in the clinic and we can transfuse it right into that dog. So this is actually interesting. So do you guys have like a specific dog just for like blood transfusions or is it like good question so we will have that we typically for like um if clinics have blood on hand we do blood donor clinics so dogs will come in donate blood very similar to a human donor clinic if it's like we need blood now we don't have like a particular blood dog on hand it's more just like we want a dog that's over 50 pounds. So we kind of have like a list of donating dogs that are willing to donate. So we'll call them up, they'll come in, they'll donate blood or my dog's too small to donate blood. But my coworker who's a veterinarian, her dog is about 60 pounds. So I'm sure that she would be willing to give blood to another dog if it was needed. Another question we have in the chat is, do you recommend taking cats on walks? <laughs> Good question. You know, whatever your cat wants, as long as your cat is not going to run away and it's on proper flea and tick and heartworm preventative, it's definitely safe to go on walks. Um, honestly, I'm the worst veterinarian ever. My dog hates, hates walks, so she doesn't go on walks but she does come to the vet clinic with me every day and she comes to the gym with me. So I feel like she gets enough other stimuli that she doesn't need walks. But if your cat loves going on walks, you should take it on walks. Another question we have is what type of animal do you specifically enjoy working with? I'd say number one, Ooh, this is tough. It's, a, it's like almost a tie between dogs and cows. Um, I do really love cows, but the medicine in cattle is so much different just because we always have to consider the economics. Um, people usually aren't willing to spend as much money on an individual cow, which is the realism of life. Um, whereas dogs, I get to do some pretty cool things. Awesome. And with that, we have come to an end of today's shadowing session. I will be sharing our end slide presentation. So in the meantime, thank you so much. This was You're such very an interesting welcome. shadowing session. You're very, very welcome. Thank you for having me. All right, we will share. All right.
share my screen. You're not able to see this, but there's a lot of people saying thank you in the chat. Um, oh, that's nice. So let's go ahead and reflect what brought you to the session today. What are three major takeaways you got from this presentation? And what do you want to learn more about? If you guys would like some little recognition in regards to articles, reflections, reviews, and success stories, you can go ahead and submit your thoughts on today's session via www.prehealthshadowing.com slash blog submissions. And if you're interested in being part of Free Health Shadowing, we are always accepting student volunteers and we're currently looking for team members. Once again, we do highly rely on our donations as well as the time of our amazing volunteers. So if you do have the time and ability to do so, we highly suggest that you give us a donation. It's via this QR code over here. And thank you all for attending this. You can go ahead and take the quiz. It will be posted soon. And it's basically 10 multiple choice quiz based on this presentation. You have two chances to pass with a 70% or higher for verification of your virtual shadowing hours. The quizzes are open indefinitely for your convenience. And if you miss any part of today's session or would like to look at other sessions, you're more than welcome to visit our YouTube channel as well as our website to watch any of our previous or current ones. Do make sure to catch up on our sessions every week. It's on our website as well as if you subscribe to our email list. Thank you so much for joining Free Health Shadowing. If you have any questions, feel free to stick around and ask your student team. So I'm just going to stop record. Okay.